Um, I thought this would be a great opportunity to talk about the dark side of industrial microbiology. When microbes damage fluids and the systems in which they are contained. And I've got it as the 16th of September because where I'm sitting in New Jersey, it's still the 16th. Now let's see if I can get my screen to advance. There we go. So uh, over the course of the next few minutes, I wanna share a few definitions. Although I confess I've been listening to the previous several presentations and uh, we're sharing a fairly common theme. So that that's very helpful. Uh, provide two examples of what I mean about biodeterioration and then wrap up with several invitations to, to listeners. I think by this part of the evening or morning or afternoon, <laughs> everybody understands that when we talk about microbiology as a discipline, we're talking about the study of organisms that are too small to see be seen by the naked eye. This includes the single cell algae, the archaea, the bacteria, uh, the yeast and molds within the, the world of fungi and protozoans. Within microbiology, we have the subdiscipline of microbial ecology. And this is the study of relationships and dynamics among microbes living within a particular environment, an ecosystem. Collectively, we refer to those microbes as the microbiome. Many of you may have heard of the Human Microbiome Project uh, recently completed and uh, giving us an insight to the number of tissues which Previously, we thought were, were sterile, and now we understand have their own microbiomes. Industrial microbiology is that branch of microbial ecology where we study the types of organisms either used for production, we use them to create antibiotics, various types of foods, specialty chemicals, and it includes the study of microorganisms that degrade materials. So we have within industrial microbiology, both what we call biotechnology, using microbes as tools for manufacturing things, and the study of microorganisms that degrade materials. Of course, even biodegradation has two sides of a coin type story. When we want the microbes to do what they do naturally, we call it bioremediation. This is when we intentionally use microbes to do things such as composting, oil spill cleanup, other types of hazardous waste cleanup, basically helping to return uh, tainted environments to their natural healthful state. When they're doing the same things, but we don't want them to be doing it, we call it biodeterioration. And a couple of compliments, and examples of this are oil field souring. That's when we produce a lot of hydrogen sulfide in the petroleum formations. And that sulfide is both a health risk, but also causes tremendous damage to oil field equipment. Microbiologically influenced corrosion and other types of damage I will mention later in this presentation. So that's biodeterioration. The little photo on the right this is, uh, oops, now it's moving, sorry. Okay, so my laser pointer went amok. Um, this is an MIC hole uh, where essentially the acids produced by microbes have eaten clean through the uh, wall of a steel pipe. So biodegradation, it can be, if we want it to happen, Good news, we call it bioremediation. If we don't want it to happen, bad news, we call it biodeterioration. And biodeterioration damage globally is estimated to cost several billion, several hundred billion dollars US each year. Uh, a lot of that is in the petroleum sector, but also damage to buildings, artworks, and library archives. The list is as long as our imaginations will allow. So what we have here is what I call atherosclerosis of a transfer pipe at a metalworking fluid system. These are 
tiny metal particles that have been glued together by biofilm and have essentially blocked off this pipe. This pipe is about 20 centimeters in diameter. And as you can see, uh, only about a third of it is still open for fluid to flow. So in the first case study, we'll talk about damage to emergency diesel generator systems. Diesel generators, well, they run remarkably on diesel fuel. <laughs> diesel fuel comes from bulk storage to day tanks that are close to the engines. Uh, typically, the day tanks will have equipment to help keep that fuel clean and in good shape. Uh, filter units, recirculating units, uh, sometimes also water separators. That fuel is then supposed to go to a diesel engine. The diesel engine, when it operates, powers a generator. If the fuel doesn't get to the engine, the generator cannot be powered and the consequences could be quite disastrous. And one of the most common causes of diesel system failure is plugged filters. And if your filter is plugged, the fuel doesn't make its way to the engine and the effects can be quite dramatic as we'll show in just another slide or two. Inside the tank, microbes grow and form biofilms. And here we have the inside of a fuel storage tank, a close up of this mass of slime and a photomicrograph of what a biofilm community looks like within that slime. Left unattended, you turn your tank into a colander. Um, this, this tank was pulled out of the ground because it had just a few holes that had been drilled by microbes. Microbes, this mass that's growing on the walls can also come free, floating in the fluid. And when that happens, you can then quickly slime over filters and that's what prevents fuel from making it through the filters. The impact, as I mentioned, fuel starvation stops engines. In facilities like data centers, hospitals, hotels, it's estimated $2 million US per minute of emergency generator engines not operating. In nuclear power facilities, if you don't have an emergency generator operating when needed, you can have a Fukushima type event. Now, the Fukushima event occurred not because fuel wasn't making it to the uh, generators. In that case, the generators were flooded, but the impact was the same. The uh, failure of the emergency generator caused the meltdown in the reactor. Similarly, in turbine oils, people say there's no water in turbine oils, but these systems can quickly accumulate traces of water. And I think as you've heard in other presentations today, it only takes a milliliter of water uh, to provide what we would consider an ocean of, of fluid in which microbes can, can thrive. And so what happens is microbes will grow in discrete points along the recirculation system. And you see a schematic on the right of a recirculating turbine oil system. And when they grow, they cause damage to the oil. So here's a close up of a system. Here's the oil reservoir. Reservoirs often will have a bottom drain. They call it a bottom drain, but uh, my friends, the engineers refuse to actually recognize what a true bottom is. And so they think, oh, two, three centimeters of water, that's a dry tank. And the microbes will give them many sleepless nights because they should have put these drains in the true bottom of the tank. When things are working well, you have nice clear oil. This is what turbine oil looks like uh, as it's in, in use. As water becomes dispersed in the order, it gets hazy. You can't see through it anymore. And in the worst case scenario, we create 
Now don't try this at home and certainly don't eat it. Something that's very similar to mayonnaise. It's, it's a, an oil and water emulsion that really mucks up the works. Turbine oil meets a variety of specifications, most obvious of which it's got to be clear. There's got to be no visible water or sediment. Its acidity, its acid number is got to be negligible. There's got to be a, a negligible measurable water concentration. It stays stable. We say that it resists oxidation. It prevents corrosion. So there are additives in this oil that help coat the metal surfaces of the system so that the oil will not allow those parts to become corroded. And its ability to flow is within very tight parameters at both 40 degrees Celsius and 100 degrees Celsius. The combination of the two we call viscosity index. Biodeterioration affects all these properties. The acid number goes up. Clearly, we're getting visible water accumulation. Were we to measure this water, it would be uh, increasingly um, turbid. And its ability to resist oxidation degrades very quickly. And we start seeing corrosion in the system. When our turbine oil conditioning system is working well, the oil that's coming back to the reservoir first goes through a preliminary filter, or in this case, a screen, and then a polishing filter, and sometimes even a chill unit with a water stripping filter. And you wind up with nice, clean turbine oil. If those filters become plugged, or if these filters no longer, especially the water removing filter, we call coalescer, can no longer do its job, instead of this, we get this or this. Microbes produce acid, and that contributes to the loss of, of oxidative stability. It also contributes to the um, corrosiveness and the acid number of the fluid. When we talk about corrosiveness, this is the inside of a transfer line that's been cut open, and you see what looks like a mountain range inside. These are corrosion tubercles. Uh, microbes are growing under these, and we have alternate layers of various iron and sulfur uh, molecules, uh, iron sulfide, um, and microbes, biofilms produce acids, and they will eat right through this pipe. The other thing microbes do is they produce surfactants. You're all familiar with surfactants. Anytime you mis mix a detergent with water, you get a water, you get an oil in water droplet we call a micelle. And in oils, we have the opposite phenomenon where the, these little red dots here, little blue dots here, have a charge, they're polar. The little squiggly tails are hydrocarbons. They're nonpolar, they do not have a charge. And so the hydrocarbons are soluble in the oil and the um, polar heads provide a capsule that traps little droplets of water. And as you see, the more droplets we get, the more it looks like mayonnaise. Finally, we produce slime, biomass. This mat, this is all biofilm, can be as tough as a, as a canvas sheet. It, it, it really is uh, well held together. Uh, I don't know if you'd want to use it to, to make a tent. The, the odor can be a little bit interesting. Um, not only does it face off filters, but as you can see in the inside here, it's also corroding the core of the filter, causing that to become damaged as well. When filters plug, no oil gets to the bearings. When there's no oil to the bearings, the bearings fail. If the bearings fail, the power generating turbine fails, and that's disastrous. So microbes in these systems produce acid, surfactant, slime. They do other things. But again, if the lights go out, 
because a power generation system has failed due to turbine oil problems, this will cost billions per minute in a large metropolitan city. Not only that, but it will increase health and safety risks. We don't understand really what's going on yet. Um, we know vaguely that if we have high bio burdens, lots of microbes present, chances of damage occurring increase. But we've seen, we being the microbiologists, the very few microbiologists that investigate these types of systems have found that if we test, we'll sometimes see very high bio burdens, but no evidence that they're doing any harm. Other times we'll get much lower bio burdens, but see considerable evidence of their doing damage. So we're just beginning to get a sense for how little we know and developing the tools for learning more. I've given two examples in the sectors where I'm personally most active. Aviation industry, microbial contamination of fuels is a, a major concern. You certainly don't want to have the fuel line plugged up uh, when you're up at uh, 50,000 feet. It, it can be embarrassing to everybody aboard the aircraft. Similarly, if you're out in the open ocean and your fuel filters plug up and you can't get fuel to drive your ship, that can be an expensive proposition. If fuel, is, or, fuel or crude oil is your cargo, microbes typically cause about 10% of the total value of that cargo is lost due to the impacts of microbes just growing in those fuel tanks during transport. Ditto for surface transportation. And I mentioned earlier in the presentation, uh, metalworking fluids are typically about 5% of a chemical mixture diluted in water, perfect environment for microbes, lots of aeration, and not only can it damage the production process, microbes can present a significant health risk to machinists exposed to this environment. I focused on the industrial side, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention there's a lot of biodeterioration going on on buildings and, and books and documents and a whole range of art objects. All these are areas where we still have tools to develop and, and need a lot more work done to develop better strategies for reducing the uh, risk of and, and for remediating when biodeterioration does occur. So I am a member of a society, International Biodeterioration and Biodegradation Society, and our members cover the gamut uh, across all areas of biodeterioration and also bioremediation or biodegradation. And I invite those listening to this presentation to, to check out our website and consider becoming uh, contributing members of our society. We are a member society of FEMS, of course, and we try to do our best to support FEMS activity. Our next international symposium will be held at Montana State University, home of the uh, uh, Biofilm uh, Center for Biofilm Engineering. A year from now, almost exactly a year from now, and you can get more information about that conference at ibbsonline.org slash meetings. Finally, for those of you listening who might be undergraduates or graduate students, we offer bursaries of up to uh, 1,000 pounds for um, undergraduates and graduate students to help them fund their research. More information can be found at this link. So I'm inviting you to join, I'm inviting you to attend, and I'm inviting those of you who are undergraduate or graduate students to apply, take advantages of what we have to offer. And with that, I'll just quickly introduce myself. I've been at this for, as my British colleagues say, donkey's years. Um, 
I first started mucking around under, underground cave streams in 1969. Um, I was a, a budding marine microbiologist when some oil field folks asked me to help them out. And I've been looking at uh, biodeterioration control since 1979. And with that, uh, if there are any questions, I'll be glad to entertain them. Thank you very much, Fred. That was really interesting. Uh, some of the examples and the forces you shared, I mean, I have a microbiology background as well, but, you know, these filters that were completely caked and covered in this slime, I mean, uh, you just had so many examples of it. I mean, how, how serious of a problem is it? Because it's something that I haven't really considered so much before, especially in fuel. And, and I will say, Ben, this is one of the things that inspired me to give uh, this evening's uh, presentation. Um, so few people are even aware that microbes can live in these nominally water-free systems. And, and one of the slides I've probably gotten more use of than any single slide in my fairly large library, I have a person standing next to Mount Kilimanjaro. And I say, that if you turn Mount Kilimanjaro upside down, hollowed it out and filled it with water, that would be like a bacterium on a surface underneath a uh, two millimeters of water. And so immeasurably small traces of water in systems create habitats where microbes can thrive. And that also makes it a challenge to collect samples uh, I advocate the people I talk to are mostly engineers and they're used to collecting representative samples. And I say, no, when we're doing microbiology, we need to get diagnostic samples and, and <laughs> the samples that make you what your urban oil quality is or your fuel quality is or your water quality is are not adequate for determining whether or not your system is at risk. And, and we're really looking for, you know, young researchers, to, to get involved in this um, less apparent and perhaps less glamorous side of uh, microbial ecology than uh, those who are doing the wonderful work in you know, industrial microbiology and molecular biology uh, in terms of using microbes to produce things. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating. And I'm, I'm wondering about some of the um... Because you talked about uh, solutions that there might be in the future, and kind of early on in the talk, you kind of alluded to the fact that possibly just having some kind of microbiology uh, input at some of the design phases, like you're talking about this, you know, the designs that didn't that didn't allow all of the water to um, to kind of clear from a system. Um, what do you see as some of the solutions maybe in the very near term trying to to fix some of the big problems they have now and hopefully you know a few years in the future with some more techn technological advances to a certain extent as you already hinted it's engineering and if every you know engineer could have a semester course in microbiology especially microbial ecology that would create a sensitivity um, just the word I, seems to have more syllables than many folks can, can handle. And so I tend to speak in terms of bugs rather than using the full word microbiology. And of course, you can see our association. Well, we just call it IBBS because international biodeterioration and biodegradation is quite a mouthful. Uh, the other thing is on the regulatory side, the chemicals that have been traditionally used to control microbial contamination in cooling tower systems, in, in personal care products, in paints and coatings, in fuels, in lubricants. Um, they're coming under regulatory pressure, some for good reasons, some for uh, non-technical reasons. <laughs> and so we have to develop strategies uh, that perhaps we haven't really given much consideration. That's, it's, you know, there are days when I wish I was 50 years younger so that I could be where I was back in 
the late 1960s, early 1970s um, with the tools we now have available that we didn't have then. Uh, and the last presentation, I don't know how many were online for it, but you know, it was wonderful discussion just the past two, three years, what we've learned about the RPA. Um, and there's still very few reports of RPA in these systems, but I believe with a perfect faith that it's just really, we haven't learned how to look, find them. We haven't learned how to detect them. Um, I recall when we were still calling them archaebacteria and thought that they only existed under extreme environments, 200 atmospheres pressure, 120 degrees Celsius, you know, temperatures. And over the course of the first decade and a half after the recovery, the more we looked, the more we found. And, and uh, we understand now that they're pretty much ubiquitous. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. And um, do you think um, microbiologists have enough um, access? Uh, so I think sometimes the problem is the kind of the, the connection and the, the dialogue that can happen between two different disciplines, such as engineering and microbiology. And they're, of course, very closely linked in this, uh, in this case. But do you think there's enough access? Because when you talk about some of the... Uh, experiments that are going on in, in, in other fields, you know that there are teams of microbiologists working on, on lots and lots of different cases and lots of different samples. Is this happening um, in, in this field? Do you think the microbiologists are getting enough access to the systems and the samples? Not enough. Uh, there was perhaps a golden era in the 40s and 50s where many of the petroleum companies had microbiology teams. Um, by the 70s, the microbiologists were, were fewer and farther between, and uh, these days they're, they're, you'll very rarely find a microbiologist at a petroleum company, as an example. Uh, and so the important multidisciplinary communications that are needed just aren't happening. And even within microbiology, we're such a large discipline and you go to an American Society of Microbiology conference and the microbial ecologists maybe represent 5% of the attendees. Um, and within that group, many of them are not really focused on industrial types of problems. They're, they're doing wonderful work at marine microbiology, aquatic microbiology, things like that. Uh, so we really need to get more people engaged and need Just wash my tongue and I can't do a thing with it. Interdisciplinary studies that look at biodeterioration of buildings, artworks. Um, you know, there's a lot of material science, there's a lot of engineering, there's a lot of chemistry, and there's a lot of microbiology. We're, I like to quote uh, Donald Rumsfeld, a former Secretary of State, and one thing that he said that I, I agreed with, that we have our known knowns, the things we know we know, <laughs> the known unknowns, the things we uh, know that we don't know. But in microbiology, I think we are um, really have a large backlog of unknown unknowns. Um, we don't even know how to ask the right questions yet. And it's yeah. wonderful being a member of a young science like microbiology. Yeah, right. I mean, um, it's exciting, isn't it? I mean, there's so much to, to discover. Um, I'm just looking through uh, social media now and see if we have any questions. I've got one from, from Facebook. Uh, Mohit is asking, uh, what kind of microbes most commonly cause the uh, biofilm formation in water tanks? So, you know, a lot of work has been done with Pseudomonas originosa. However, as we get smarter at using genomic tests, I think the answer to that question will change. Um, you know, if you're looking for a particular organism, if you have traditionally been focused on culture methods. Uh, historically, Pseudomonas has been one of the easiest to recover from surface swab type samples. I would be reticent to say that's the most common microbe in biofilms. Um, 
th there's a tremendous amount of complex complexity. And again, I think we're still developing effective methods for parsing out what's present. It's a terrific question. I hope you'll follow up and do some research to, <laughs> to provide us with mm -hmm. some answers. Yeah, I hope so too. Um, I was wondering in your presentation, uh, the previous presentation from Benjamin, how how much kind of media coverage uh, affects uh, kind of research and what's going on in the field. I mean, the two examples that spring to mind. So when you talk about Fukushima and these kind of huge disasters, and I also think about a few years ago, I think there was this um, some kind of biofilm on one of the, the monuments. It might have been the Washington Monument or something like that. And that suddenly somehow got a lot of press coverage, the fact that there was this thing growing on, on one of these treasured monuments in the US. Do you see any impact of that kind of discussion or media coverage on research and investment? In most of the areas where I am in directly involved, um, people would prefer there not be press coverage. I'll, my poster child for that is a, a certain petroleum company who uh, one year had a pipeline failure that set them back about $5 billion. Um, and that was because they had, quote, saved money on, on manual testing. They were using a very smart uh, device that went through pipelines and could detect everything, except it couldn't detect MIC. And, and so they had this one failure event, spent a tremendous amount of money on uh, public relations about how it would never happen again. And then two years later, they had a much smaller event that only set them back $2 billion. Now, you know, as, as a poor microbiologist, when I think of $7 billion and, and what I could do with that in terms of um, condition monitoring, research, and, and improving preventive processes, it boggles my mind. But over and over again, you see corporations with that kind of funding and with those sorts of problems uh, pretend that an event is a black swan. It'll never happen again. Wow. And it, it, it's very frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of, um, yeah, it's kind of mind boggling that, that, I mean, because those <laughs> sums of money, I mean, they're not, uh, they're not sums that I'm used to kind of, uh, dealing with. You'd think it would be worth, um, looking into <laughs> yeah we had we had a uh, a senator late great uh, strom thurman used to say a billion dollars here a billion dollars there and before you know it you're talking about real money um <laughs> and, and it, it really i find that the uh, return on investment um can be in the millions of dollars per year for even relatively small operators and they're because they aren't educated in microbiology. They are disinclined to invest, or I say in the petroleum retail site, side where, again, the simple filter plugging issue can save a individual four court operator as much as a million dollars a year per dispenser on their site. So you go to, up to a modern four court, uh, and uh, I think even in, uh, you're in the Netherlands, uh, so I think even there, you have four courts that have anywhere from 12 to 16 dispensers. And if each dispenser is experiencing opportunity costs, just I'm not talking about damage, I'm just talking about because you're restricting the flow of fuel through the dispenser, half a million dollars. And you've got, you know, let's say you've got 10 dispensers, so that's $5 million per year that you don't need to be spending if you would only do a better job of condition monitoring and contamination control. And yeah. for 40 years, I've been trying to convince operators to do that. And, and very few have actually even tested my model, let alone taken my recommendations. Wow. <laughs> I hope spring's eternal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, if, uh, if you were going to spend, you know, fifty thousand dollars in order to save a million dollars, how much thought would you give to that? Right. Uh, and uh, I've I've found it, and I think part of the issue is uh, there are fewer than a dozen people 
seriously studying fuel microbiology in the world. We need more people involved. And as we get more people involved, then it'll be easier to communicate to the non-microbiologists. It sounds like a good, um, a good call to uh, call to action, call to arms. We need more, we need more research. Certainly. Certainly. Do you think? Um, do I, do, do, is there any problem with the the kind of the the fuel that's going into the cars? Then you saw about the the forecourts. Do, does it affect the the cars at all? The consumers. When the any... fuel is degraded, yes. Um, most often, let's uh, some years ago, I, I tried to talk to the manufacturer, but they wouldn't talk to me. But um, a local repair shop told me that their supplier of aftermarket passenger vehicle fuel tanks, their sales were up 200% um, over the previous decade. So as uh, Again, fuel becomes more severely refined. Uh, when we go to the biofuels, the biofuels tend to be more readily biodegraded and more susceptible. They hold more water. Therefore, they provide a uh, more easily provide a, a suitable environment for microbes to grow in the tanks and cause uh, fuel tank deterioration. Right. So it's it's, well, it's the sort of stuff that happens all the time, but it's um, the analogy I use is I've, I've worn glasses most of my life, but if I hadn't, I wouldn't know that I had a vision problem. Um, it's only after you get the corrective lenses you begin to realize what you've been missing, and and I feel that's the situation we are when it comes to biodeterioration. People are used to spending sums of money because of the damage caused by microbes without even realizing that's why they're spending that money. And, and until we get a critical threshold of people that recognize the issue and uh, take preventive measures, it's a, it's a Gibbs free energy constant <laughs> we have to overcome. Uh, and that's why our outreach for IBBS is to help make more people aware of the the dark side of microbial ecology. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, I think coming back to, to that is the perfect place to, to leave it. Thank you so much for your presentation, the discussion. See, there's some contact details on the slide here. Is that the best place for people Absolutely. to, to get in Absolutely. Just go to the website you? and uh, my email address is at the bottom of the slide. It's also available from the website and uh, you know, shameful promotion, uh, self-promotion. I, I do have a, a fairly long blog series, mini articles about various aspects of uh, microbial problems in a variety of industrial systems. Oh, great. Great, great. Um, then, yeah, um, everyone go on and check those out. And thank you very much, Fred, again. Um, yeah, we're going to take a short 20 minute uh, break uh, now, but we'll be back in 20 minutes with uh, another uh, live presentation. So stay very tuned. And uh, thank you, Ben. Great questions. No problem. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. We'll speak so soon. Bye now.